Are you tired of cultivating large leads in the early game only to inexplicably fall behind in the late game? Do you constantly die to impossibly strong seeming tank and artillery pushes in all of your games? Fret not, dear viewer, for with the help of this guide, you'll learn how strong players are able to take control of the late game in Civ 6 multiplayer. In today's video, I'll be explaining how to optimize your gameplay during the Renaissance, Industrial, and Early Modern era of the game when playing Civ 6 multiplayer with a better balanced game mod. In this video, we'll be examining how I converted two very different early games into powerful late games. First, we'll look at a game where I played as Khmer, using a religious build with a monumentality opener, and afterwards, we'll examine a game where I played as Kree, using a standard internal trade route opener with Magnus. Starting with the Khmer game, you can see that by turn 55, my land is already thoroughly developed. Most of my forests have been harvested, and most of my tiles my cities are working have been improved. If you struggle to get to this stage for the game on a good pace, I'd recommend watching my earlier guide on feudalism before continuing with this one. Ideally, in every game you should be aiming to reach the industrialization technology as soon as possible. This tech represents the single largest power spike of any technology in the game, granting access to factories, coal power plants, and granting plus one production to all mines everywhere in your empire. However, before rushing to industrialize, it's important to make a few pit stops lower in the tech tree. We want to grab engineering in order to set up our aqueducts, education to unlock universities, and the tech's military engineering and stirrups, so we have the ability to defend ourselves. Military engineering also reveals niter, while stirrups grants plus one food on every pasture in your empire. Both of these bonuses help to increase your tile yield somewhat. If you're at war, the ballistics technology, which unlocks cuirassiers and field cannons, should be your number one priority. These two units can wipe the floor with units from earlier eras. Notably, the ballistics technology has very few prerequisite technologies, allowing you to rush it extremely quickly. Fortunately, in this game, we're not at war and aren't being threatened, so a tech tree such as this is sufficient preparation for rushing industrialization. One last consideration. There are two top tier wonders tucked away at the bottom of the tech tree. Kilwa Kisiwani at machinery and Forbidden City at printing. It's worth grabbing these technologies if you want to build either of these wonders, but otherwise you can safely ignore them in favor of rushing industrialization faster. Before we continue, it's important that I briefly cover how science overflows when you research cheap technologies. Here we can see that I am researching bronze working. On online speed, this technology costs 40 science, and as I have the Eureka triggered, it's reduced by 40% to a final cost of 24 science. However, I have 66 science per turn. So, is the extra science lost? No, the extra 42 science that I generate beyond what's necessary to complete the tech overflows to the next turn. This effect can stack infinitely, so long as you keep researching technologies that you have more science than is necessary to complete in one turn. The reason this is important is because going for industrialization will involve grabbing a lot of cheap technologies in a row, sailing, shipbuilding, etc. This means that you can bake up some science overflow on your way through these early technologies, allowing you to complete industrialization faster than you might first expect. Remember this concept of science overflow, as it'll come up again later. Now, what do we actually produce in our cities during this stage of the game? We've already finished all of our settlers, we've improved all of our tiles, and we've jumpstarted our infrastructure when we chopped all of our forests earlier. Well, firstly, you want to get down campuses. You should get a campus down in nearly every large city you have, and fill it out with a library and university. This is the stage for the game where good scouting really pays off. The more blue city-states you've met, the more power you'll get out of each library and university. Fill up each blue city-state with three envoys to supercharge your science. Another thing you should be setting up at this stage of the game is your industrial zones. Plan out your industrial zone placements so you can tag as many of your cities with a factory's AoE as possible. Use aqueducts, quarries, and strategic resources to increase your industrial zone adjacencies. And remember, the Craftsman Policy card doubles industrial zone adjacency, and then coal power plants grant production equal to the adjacency of the industrial zone they're built in. Due to these effects, every one point of industrial zone adjacency will turn into four production later in the game. So be sure to maximize the value you're getting out of your industrial zones by thoroughly planning them for good adjacencies. 
Make sure to remember to also build two workshops before you start researching industrialization, in order to trigger the Eureka for it. What do you do, however, when you've already finished producing everything obvious? It can be easy to look at a city whose districts are completely filled out and have no idea what to make next. In this case, simply remember the follow initialism. Poop. Pre-builds, Eurekas, Wonders, and Projects. The first letter in poop stands for pre-builds. Pre-building in Civ 6 refers to the act of making cheap military units with the intent of upgrading them later. For example, you can keep a standing army of knights and trebuchets with the intent of only using them later in the game once you unlock the technologies to upgrade them to tanks and artillery. Making a healthy amount of pre-builds will make you far more resilient to attacks from other players, and because your military score is visible to all players, it'll help to dissuade anyone from attacking you in the first place. It should be noted that religious civs that have access to Grandmaster's Chapel do not need to use production to pre-build their units. In this game, you can see that I use Faith to buy a large number of pre-builds just before finishing Terracotta Army. This gives me a massive, fully promoted army that I can upgrade at a moment's notice later into the game. The second letter in poop stands for Eurekas, an often overlooked method of spending production by new players. This refers to the act of making things you don't necessarily need purely in order to trigger a Eureka. For example, making two crossbowmen to trigger the Eureka for metal casting, or making two banks to trigger the Eureka for economics. Of course, grabbing inspirations for civics is important too. Building an archaeological museum to boost natural history is always a good use of your production. If you find yourself at a loss for what to produce in a city, producing the prerequisites for a Eureka or an Inspiration is always a safe bet. The third letter of poop, W, is obvious. World Wonders are a very useful way to spend some of your excess production. However, they can also be a bit of a noob trap. If the only wonders available to a city are all low quality, such as a useless great lighthouse, then be wary of spending your production on them. Lower tier wonders can be useful for hitting Golden Age in a pinch, but if you don't need the error score, you probably have a better use for your production. The final letter in poop stands for projects. This refers to running district projects in order to generate bursts of great person points. This option is easily the most overlooked and underutilized by inexperienced players. The Renaissance and Industrial eras are overflowing with excellent great people of all types. In this game, you can see most of my core cities are running projects on turn 56. I'm aiming to snatch two top tier great people who are up for grabs. A great engineer, Isidore of Miletus, and a great scientist, Ibn Khaldun. Many of these great people are as strong as top tier wonders, and it's amazing how often they go completely uncontested in multiplayer Civ 6 lobbies. So, remember, if you're in the mid game, a city has already finished its core infrastructure, and you're at a loss for what to produce, produce poop. Poop will never let you down. Once you've finished researching industrialization, put up your factories and power plants ASAP. The amount of production these give cannot be overstated. Even your smallest cities will become productive powerhouses once they're tagged by a factory's area of effect bonus. After finishing industrialization, we reach a crossroads. There are multiple different ways forward which are highly dependent upon the context of your specific game. This is the stage of the game, around turn 70, where I take a step back and start formulating my long-term game plan. The power rankings of the players in the lobby have started to become clear, and you need to decide what you're playing for. Do you go for a victory condition, or are you just going to choose violence? The risky path is to play for first. This involves going straight for the technology chemistry in order to unlock research labs and further bolster your science. However, this involves risk. Chemistry is on the top side of the tech tree, far away from the powerful war technologies like military science, steel, and combustion. If you're not careful, you could be left vulnerable to an attack. This is why I only go for chemistry if I'm sure I'm safe. Understanding the game state of other players and figuring out their game plan is key here. In this game, I have three neighbors, Victoria Age of Steam to my north, Harold Varangian to my east, and Teddy Bullmoose to my west. Victoria and Harold are both allied to me and do not stand to benefit from backstabbing me, so I know I'm safe on those fronts. Teddy Bullmoose is a greedy culture victory Civ, and he's on good pace. Therefore, I can safely assume he'll be pathing along the top of the tech tree to get to the technology computers, which increases tourism empire-wide by 50%. 
Because of this, I know I'm extremely unlikely to be attacked in the near future and can safely go for chemistry in order to remain competitive for a science victory. Remember that bit I mentioned earlier about how science overflow works? This is where managing that becomes critical. You see, you can only ever complete one technology per turn through ordinary research, and it's critical if you're going for science victory to keep that one tech per turn pace going for as long as possible. In this example, I only have 270 science per turn, and I want to grab the technology sanitation, which costs 530 science. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have been able to finish it in one turn. However, by grabbing siege tactics and metal casting on the previous two turns, both at a discount because I triggered their Eurekas, I'm able to bank up enough science overflow that I can still complete sanitation in just one turn. If you fail to utilize science overflow properly by alternating between cheaper and more expensive technologies, you may find yourself falling behind in the number of actual techs completed compared to other players, even if they don't have more science per turn than you. Once everyone gets research labs up and has sufficient science to complete one tech per turn for the rest of the game, the concrete number of technologies you finished up until that point can become the critical factor that determines who is able to win science victory in the end. Therefore, you should always remember to utilize science overflow and trigger as many Eurekas as possible in order to secure the lead in technologies completed as you rush chemistry. There is, however, a safer strategy than rushing straight for the chemistry technology. This strategy is to rush for the combustion technology following your completion of industrialization. This tech pathing will unlock steel, which grants powerful walls to every city in your entire empire, as well as unlocking tanks and artillery, which are the backbone of one of the most powerful, iconic timed pushes in Civ VI. If you're going this path, remember, pre-build, pre-build, pre-build. You want to make as many bombards and knights as you can before those units become obsolete in order to get the cheaper production costs all the while saving your gold. Then, once you've finished unlocking combustion, slot in the policy card to discount gold upgrades by 50% and upgrade all of your units to their modern era equivalents at once. In games where you decide to rush chemistry for research labs, as I did here, you still want to always beeline your way back down along the bottom of the tech tree to grab combustion afterwards in order to stay safe. Trying to stop an opponent's tank and artillery push if you don't even have steel researched yet is nearly impossible. Throw in a great general and an observation balloon to further buff up the artillery and you can forget about it. Cities will melt one by one. But Herson, you might argue, AT crews are unlocked at chemistry. Can't AT crews stop tanks? Indeed, it may seem intuitive to believe that a modern era anti-cavalry unit is sufficient to stop a modern era heavy cavalry push. However, what you're failing to account for is the potency of artillery. Artillery are the first siege unit of the game which actually do enough damage to melt not only cities, but also units. With tanks having 5 movement points and AT crews having only 2, Good luck maneuvering your way around the tanks to actually reach the artillery. Indeed, the only reliable way in Civ 6 to stop tanks and artillery is to have tanks of your own. With all of that covered, let's take a look at the second game where I played Kree. My spawn is far less ideal than in the Khmer game, as I'm forced to go for an unconventional harbor opener on a Civ that would greatly prefer an inland spawn. Jumping ahead to turn 57, I decide to go for Free Inquiry as my second Golden Age dedication. Free Inquiry is generally a poor choice for your first Golden Age starting on turn 30, but it often makes sense when going into your second Golden Age. This is because by this stage of the game, you now have access to policy cards which double the adjacency bonuses of your harbors and commercial hubs. As Free Inquiry's Golden Age dedication bonus grants science equal to the adjacencies of these districts, it can become very potent with these cards. In this game, I have a harbor in most cities, and I've met four cultural city-states but zero scientific ones. Therefore, it's only natural to go for the Golden Age dedication which grants free science from harbors and rely on the buffed up theater squares from all of the city-states I've met for generating my culture. As I'll be using this game to illustrate, culture and the civics tree also play a huge role in the industrial and modern eras of the game. One thing to note is that, even though I played an opener based entirely around running internal trade routes with the Governor Magnus, I still switched entirely to external trade routes upon completing the civic diplomatic service. 
This Civic unlocks the Whistle Bank and Policy card, which is the clear point at which external trade routes completely outscale internal trade routes. Make sure to switch all of your trade routes to run to an ally once you unlock this card. Flash forward a bit and I get the great scientist Eben Khaldun. One of the best great people in the game, he increases the bonus yields amenities grant you throughout your empire. However, I have a problem this game. I'm struggling to hit the breakpoints for happiness in my cities. You see, cities gain plus 10% to production, science, culture, gold, and faith when they're at 3 or more amenities, and plus 20% to those yields when they're at 5 or more amenities. It is direly important that you keep an eye on your amenities in order to maximize the strength of your empire. So, how do I go about getting more? First off, I trade my duplicate luxury resources with other players for copies of resources I don't have yet. To make this easier, I use the global resources screen, which keeps track of the amount of luxury resources everyone has. Importantly, this screen will also track resources you're already receiving in trades with other players. This will help you to avoid accidentally trading for the same luxury resource multiple times. Secondly, I use policy cards to shore up my amenities. Republican Legacy, which grants plus one amenity and plus one housing to every city with a specialty district, is one of the most powerful cards in the entire game for this reason. I keep this policy card in for nearly the entire game here. At the Enlightenment, I unlock the policy card Liberalism, which finally allows me to comfortably get all of my cities to plus three amenities, reaching the threshold where they get the bonus yields. While this card might look underwhelming, it's actually giving me more bonus yields than any of the other policy cards I have slotted in. Amenities are just that important. However, plus three amenities is not good enough. I want to get to plus five amenities in order to reach the threshold for ecstatic so that my cities can get the maximum amount of bonus yields from happiness. In order to do this, I need the help of the civic natural history. This civic is the most powerful civic in the industrial era for bolstering your sim. It unlocks zoos and aquariums, which grant plus one amenity to every city center within six tiles. Furthermore, it unlocks archaeologists, which are an excellent way to bolster your culture in this stage of the game. Each archaeologist can dig up three artifacts, effectively meaning that they're giving you a minimum of 18 culture per turn each. Not only that, they also give you plus one era score every time they dig up an antiquity site. This makes hitting your next golden age a cakewalk. I recommend always making one archaeological museum before researching natural history in order to trigger the inspiration, and then making more depending on how many dig sites you end up revealing. With our zoos and aquariums up, our people are finally ecstatic, boosting all yields in our empire by 28% thanks to the help of the great scientist we recruited earlier. So is that all there is to the civic tree? Of course not. There are a few extremely important civics left in the industrial and modern era to consider. First, nationalism and mobilization. These two civics unlock the ability to form corps and armies respectively. Critical for warfare, these civics can easily dictate the outcome in a war between two technologically tied powers. What's more, forming your first corpse, army, fleet, and armada all grant bonus era score, which can be the difference maker when it comes to hitting your golden ages. Lastly, the most important civics in the game, and the real reason that culture is so important, the tier 3 governments. The amount of bonuses granted by these are absurd. First, let's examine fascism. Fascism grants plus 50% production towards all units in your empire, and plus 5 combat strength on all units. This is ridiculous. Imagine, for instance, a war between two civs on turn 90, one with 300 science and 150 culture, and another with 300 science and 300 culture. The best unit both of them have are tanks, so it should be a deadlock, right? WRONG! The guy with more culture will have plus 5 strength on all of his units, plus 50% extra production towards all units, and will have unlocked the policy card at Ideology which grants plus 50% production towards modern era cavalry units. His tanks are basically half cost and have 5 more combat strength than his opponents. What's more, his opponent may not even have mobilization unlocked. If you don't have the ability to form armies yet and you're being pushed by a civ who's in fascism, you can basically just give up. This is how I was able to safely kill Nubia in my previous game as Khmer, despite our units being technologically equivalent. Democracy, on the other hand, is more geared towards the peaceful pursuit of science or culture victory. 
It grants plus four food and plus four production on all international trade routes. Just look at those yields. Furthermore, it unlocks the New Deal Policy Card, which grants plus two amenities and plus four housing to all of your cities, and is unequivocally the best policy card in the entire game. This government's not too shabby at war, either. It also unlocks the policy card Their Finest Hour, which grants plus five combat strength to units in friendly territory. The last government, communism, seems great in theory. However, whenever it's put into practice, it always seems to be outperformed by the other two. The only civs which prefer this government are ones with bonuses to internal trade routes, such as Tokugawa or the Persian leaders. For all other civs, you can safely ignore this government. Lastly, upon adopting a tier 3 government, you unlock the ability to build a new building in your government plaza. The Natural History Museum is useful for culture victory, the Royal Society is useful for science victory, what with it allowing you to finish the space projects quickly, and the War Department is incredible for war. Having your units heal for 30 HP every time they kill an opposing unit is huge. Oftentimes, even when pursuing science or culture victory, civs still opt to build War Department for the power it provides. What's more, building one of these buildings will unlock a legacy policy card based on the government you're in when they're completed. A common strategy is to go fascism initially, build a government plaza building to unlock the fascist legacy policy card, and then swap to democracy afterwards. I actually do this in both of the two games I've shown to you today. With the fascist legacy policy card, you retain the plus 5 combat strength at all times, even while enjoying the benefits of democracy. Furthermore, you can stack this policy card with Democracy's Their Finest Hour card to get a whopping plus 10 combat strength on all units in your home territory. That just about wraps up the content for this video. You're now fully equipped to enter into the late game of Civ 6 multiplayer. If you want to see more content like this, subscribe to the channel, like the video, and leave a comment about what you want to see next. Be sure to follow me on Twitch where you can catch me playing full games of Civ 6 multiplayer live. If you ever want to play multiplayer Civ 6 with a better balanced game mod for yourself, check the description of the video for a link to the CPL Discord. Thanks for watching.